there. We're back in business. Hello. 208, not bad, not bad. That's one thing that happens every single semester. It's like the later in the semester it gets, the, the more time it takes till class actually starts. So I've accepted that as just, you know, a consequence of, of life. But we're all here. Everyone can hear me, see me, hopefully. We have some new stuff to talk about. So thank you for turning in homework five. I look forward to reading those and giving you feedback. I hope to get them back to you within a week or so. And if you are happy with your scores, you don't have to do anything further. If you'd like to fix a few things and earn a couple points back, and that is due at the end of finals week. So along with your last homework, which is not yet ready. What you can get started on though are, uh, actually is your last formative assessment, which I put up this morning. It is an opportunity for you to respond to reviewer three based on a true story, dot, dot, dot. So uh, it's on, on content that uh, is definitely part of this class, but hopefully to give you practice in trying to describe things to other people who may not have had this type of integrated perspective in terms of psychometric models. Historically, they get taught in silos, right? There's a CFA and SEM class, and there's an IRT class, and there's a this class. And in trying to break across the silos, sometimes we struggle to convey exactly what we mean in writing. So this will give us a chance to practice uh, some of those things. I do have new material for today, which hopefully everybody had a chance to download. Higher order factor models, bi-factor models. So we have an example that goes with the higher order portion of the program, and then I have some examples built into the slides, some of which are new relative to what I've done before, so I got a chance to work on that yesterday, which is exciting. Um, yeah, so your last homework is not ready yet, but what it will be will be CAN data doing invariance analyses. So we'll take the gambling data, and you'll be doing invariance across people who identify as problematic gamblers and people who do not. So get a chance to practice both the CFA and the IFA side of invariance testing. So once I get it up, you'll be able to do it all, as quickly or as slowly as you wish. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are um, trying to catch up in terms of submitting either homework three or five, if you could please send me an email when you do submit it. That way I will know that it's there and I can go look for it to try to get you feedback as soon as possible. That would be appreciated because otherwise I don't pay attention to when things get submitted on ICON. It doesn't buzz me or anything like that. All right. Let's see. I think that's all the logistics stuff I can think of. What am I forgetting? Anything? No? Well, I can't say happy garbage day. It's not garbage day today because of Thanksgiving last week. Garbage day is tomorrow. But I need to tell that to all of my neighbors because all of their stuff is out. So. That will be fun later today when the wind picks up and blows it all the way across the street. Then you get to play like bumper cars with everyone's trash cans as you're driving through your neighborhood. That's always entertaining. All right. Are you ready to talk about some new stuff? Yeah, so we're heading into what would be called, I guess, the SEM proper portion of the program over our last two weeks. And the good news is that once you know how to build a measurement model, how to put multiple measurement models together and how to put in relationships among your factors is actually pretty straightforward. There's a lot fewer ways to screw it up, let's put it that way. And so that's why I spend all of my time on measurement models because the SEM portion, there's relatively few things that you would have to think about. And you already have all of the tools that you need to think about them. It's just a question of seeing it in application. So as our first step in heading that way, let's see. Let's start, start this part here. Let's revisit uh, the big picture and why all of the distinctions across different measurement models stop mattering at this point. So what I would recommend in practice, sort of reviewing where we've been this semester, in specifying your measurement model, and how do you know if you should use a CFA, an IFA, or something else? What determines which one is going to be most suitable? Yeah, what kind of outcome you have. So CFA is designed for what kind of outcomes? Continuous and normally distributed. Can you even think of an item response format that lends itself to that? I can't. 
All the things I can think of that are continuous still have some sort of boundary on them, such as response time or magnitude estimation, where you like drag a ruler back and forth. Like there's, there's endpoints to that. So CFA is really like continuous and normal enough so that a linear model is plausible. CFA is a lot easier to work with in terms of estimation. But what if you have, say, binary data, ordinal data, nominal data? Then what? We can use some IRT or ICA. Or yeah, IRT slash IFA. So in terms of terminology, what I'm using the term IFA to deliberately not overlap with CFA because these are different models. They're both confirmatory, and they're both factor analyses, which is why the, the confusion of the terminology happens. But an IFA or an IRT model is a nonlinear model. It specifies a nonlinear relationship as the trade is the predictor and the outcome is the item response, whereas CFA is a linear relationship. IFA slash IRT uses link functions so that the probability of each response category is what theta is predicting, but it's doing it through a link so that the model parameters can be interpreted in a linear fashion as usual. IFA slash IRT involves other distributions for the item responses besides normal. So if it's binary, what kind of distribution is that? Bernoulli. Bernoulli. If it's ordinal or nominal? Multinomial. Multinomial. Uh, could I have a count? Yeah. Like a Poisson or something? Absolutely. So you can swap out whatever kind of link function and distribution you need to predict your outcome, and you can still have a latent trait model. So CFA, to me, is the linear case specifically. IFA is the nonlinear case that involves either thresholds or difficulties, depending on how the model is parameterized. IFA would also be known as CFA for categorical data. But if you see the words like WLSMB or diagonally weighted least squares estimation, you know that it's talking about an IFA or IRT model because that's not a thing in regular CFA. So the type of response that you have dictates what kind of model you would choose. And there may be some ambiguity as to like if you have five response options, six response options, then maybe CFA could be okay enough but it depends on how those response options are used. So if you have, say, a seven-point scale, but everybody answers one or two, and very few people answer the rest of them, a linear model is not going to work for that. Even though there's seven choices, they're not, it's not a symmetric, continuous-looking variable. So we pick our measurement model. How many factors, thetas, let's do all the synonyms for that. Give me other, other words you can think of that go with factor or theta. Latent trait. trait, latent factor, latent, there's another one, starts with a V, variable, variable. Uh, theta is what it's always called in IRT, is there any other term besides IRT besides theta, ability maybe, mm. ability that one, uh, latent construct, true score, the thing you're trying to measure that you have to do so indirectly, broadly construed. Um, in writing, I would pick one term, by the way, and stick with it consistently. I would not use synonyms because people might think you mean something different if you start saying trait versus factor, and it could become confusing. Which one to pick? It depends on the context, but I would pick one and go with it. So your ideas as to what the items are supposed to measure then dictate which items should be treated as indicators of which factors. That's the confirmatory aspect. You are saying... This item measures factor A, it does not measure factor B. This other item does measure factor B, it does not measure factor A. Uh, could it measure both? Could you have an item measure two things? You could. That would be cons one of them would be considered a cross-loading for the one it wasn't intended to measure. Is that a great idea? Not often. If there's multiple reasons why someone could answer the question a certain way, you don't know which reason is the one that's guiding their answer. My recommendation, by the way, is whenever you have at least four indicators, I would fit a model separately for each trait. Because that way you know that like that stands on its own before you start putting stuff together. In contrast, if you're trying to troubleshoot a giant model, it can be very tricky 
Can you picture like a residual covariance matrix that's like 30 by 30 and you're trying to look through it and find all the spots? Like that's a really difficult task. If you know that each factor fits its items per se, then when you put all of the factors into the same model, the most likely reason that it doesn't fit at that point is because of cross-factor relationships. Like this item that I thought was going to go on factor A wants to have an extra correlation with this item over here on factor B. And then you'd have to decide if that makes sense or not and what to do about it. So the idea of what to do about it is one of the things I wanted to emphasize in this lecture. What are some strategies that you can use besides error covariances to account for unintended correlation across your items for reasons besides the traits? So when we get each model then, global fit, local fit, so making sure there's no specific uh, represent misrepresented correlations or covariances among your items. Uh, by the way, in my IFA example, I had mentioned looking at the discrepancies between the model predicted correlations and the real ones. And in my example, I had said that they were less than 0.07 in absolute value, and so I called that good enough. That's just what happened in that data set. Like 0.07 is not a standard. You would have to look at it and decide, is that okay, or is that like, is that too big in terms of like how mispredicted the correlation is? In CFA models, that's relatively straightforward. It becomes less straightforward in IFA models because of the weighting. So the WLS MV part, what it's doing is trying to pay more attention to recreating the correlations that are estimated well than the correlations that are estimated less well. So a larger discrepancy could be less impactful in the model if the model isn't really sure what the correlation is supposed to be in the first place. So that's where looking at the modification indices and the change in the chi-square that should result can help you say, okay, this one really is a problem because this correlation was well estimated. It's not being recreated well. That indicates a misspecification that I need to worry about. And then once it fits, you're not done yet whether or not your loadings are practically meaningful, whether or not your test information is sufficient, you can have a very well-fitting model that has no information to it. And that would be arguably not that useful. So once we've crossed through all of this, these thresholds, right, you have your measurement model set up, you're happy with the way that the items are, uh, the, the, you're happy with the way the traits are recreating your item relationships, then you can focus on the structural model. So the relationships among your traits. Do you want them to just correlate? Do you want one trait to predict another trait? Do you think your traits are indicators of some higher order thing? That's what we're talking about here. Um, should you try to build in error type relationships in a more principled way by putting in what are called method factors or specific factors, which leads to what is known as a bi-factor model in an IRT context? We will talk about those as well. So focusing just on the structural part then for the remainder of our time here. So in terms of higher order factor models, so the, the idea of the higher order factor, let me see if I can get to a picture real quick, is something like this. So this is what we're talking about. Fast forwarding just a second. Let's say that I have Three subscales, such as forgiveness of self, forgiveness of others, and forgiveness of situation. And I think that forgiveness is the general trait that's being measured in these three specific ways. There's a lot of, of scales that are built that way, where there's subscales, but they're meant to indicate one general thing. This type of structure, in which you have a general factor that is predicting each of the lower order factors, this is called a higher order factor model or a second order factor model. You can take your pick. That's what HF stands for. So that's what we're talking about first. So the purpose of the higher order factor is to account for covariances among lower order factors. So in the same way that the factor originally was supposed to recreate the item covariances, a higher order factor is supposed to recreate the lower order covariances. So the reason why forgiveness of self, others, and situations, the reason why those factors are related is because they're all indicators of this more general trait. That is the reason 
and it's disconfirmable in the same way that your measurement model is if you have enough information to do so. So the best fitting baseline that we want to start with for any kind of structural equation model would be a saturated structural model, meaning that there is a direct relationship between every pair of latent factors in your model, probably a covariance. Just let them all be correlated because that is as good as you can get with respect to your structural model. Anything that you would then do to take paths out or to replace them with higher order factors is then going to create worse fit or not worse fit relative to the best where everything is correlated the way it wants to be. That's not something that is often recognized when people fit SEMs in practice. It's commonly the case that they'll do the whole thing at once and be like, the whole thing fits, yay me. But most of that weight in terms of the fit is coming from the measurement models. You can have a structural model that's misspecified and not realize it because your measurement models are okay. So we're going to emphasize what is the best possible fit for a structural model, and then if I simplify it, is it not worse? That's what we want to look for. In the same way that we started with a saturated model for our items, right? What was the saturated model, the H1 perfect model? Remember this? The data, right? The, the data, right? More specifically, three things, usually if it's CFA to start with. The mean, the variances, and the error, would that be it? Uh, covariances. Thank you. Yes, so, so in the original, like when we're first building measurement models for items, the saturated model lets all of the items just have whatever covariances they want, whatever variances they want, whatever means they want. So analogously, the structural model is the same way, but for the factors. The factors just get to have whatever variance they want, whatever mean they want, whatever covariance they want. That's as good as it gets. That's our comparison against anything that's simpler. So like mediation models, higher order factor models, anything where we're trying to say the relationship between the factors does not get perfectly accounted for by paths. There's, there's not often situations, but there are some, and higher order factors is one. Okay. I'm talking fast. How, how are we doing so far? Question? Good. Um, do we, we usually fix the means and the variances to zero and one. So with these, would we do something different? We do do something okay. different, yeah. The means are going to stay fixed to zero. The variances are going to have to be estimated. Cool. Yep. Yes, indeed. Because part of the, the job of the structural model may be to explain the factor variance, and I mean that in like a regression, like this factor predicts this factor kind of way, in which case we'd want to talk about our square for the outcome factor, and we'd want its variance to become smaller after it's been predicted because it's leftover variance at that point. And so that's why that number has to be free to move around. It can't be nailed down to one. I've seen it work nailed down to one, but I've also seen convergence problems that went away when you changed the way it was identified. So as a, as a most conservative course of action, we're going to estimate the factor variances from this point forward. Yep. Okay. So, let's see here. So, higher order factor models in particular are trying to recreate the covariances among the lower order factor models. And a higher order factor, a single one, would be suggested by a pattern of correlation among the lower order factors where they're roughly correlated to the same extent. So the same as we would look for at the item level. If items have different pockets of correlation, that's an indicator that one factor is not going to work. Same here. If you have like different pockets of correlation among your latent factors, then a single higher order factor is probably not going to work either. Same exact concept, just an order of magnitude higher. So at this point, when we start talking about factors, it does not matter whether we have a CFA model, an IFA model, or some combination of both because factors are continuous variables that are assumed to be multivariate normal. So everything with respect to the factors is like CFA. No link functions, linear prediction, unless specified otherwise, and normal distributions for the factor residuals. So it simplifies at that point. Means in most cases are going to stay in the measurement model. So if we estimate all possible intercepts or all possible thresholds and fix the factor means to zero, 
then we don't worry about that side of the model in the higher order model. It's only the variances and loadings that we have to worry about from that point forward because there's no new information. The factors don't have means of their own. They had to borrow them from the indicators. All right, so this is my recommendation for how I would start off identifying the lower order factors if I know that I want to test the fit of a higher order factor. I would switch from using a variance of the factor fixed to one or some other constant to using the marker item instead. So in this method of identification, the variance of the factor is going to become the amount of that item's variance that was due to the factor. We can figure that out by referring to the item's standardized factor loading. So if I know that my item's standardized factor loading, say, is 0.8, if I square 0.8, that's 0.64. Another way of saying that is that a standardized loading of 0.8 squared means that that item is 64% factor, 36% something else. So then the factor variance would become 0.64 times whatever that item's variance would be. So the amount of factor do variance goes up to the factor and that's what it becomes. So then when we, we have to think about this in terms of like what a unit is because it's not going to be one as a standard deviation anymore. It's going to be tied to whatever the scale of your items are. So it's the marker item with respect to identifying the factor variance so that this factor variance can become an estimated quantity. On the mean side though we keep it the same. In most cases, you would continue to estimate all intercepts or thresholds and fix all the factor means to zero, and we don't worry about them from then on because there's no new information at the structural level with respect to the means at that point. Okay, with me so far? Cool. So here's some options. So I'm dividing up the model degrees of freedom into the part that's due to the measure mo measurement model and the structural model. So if I have 12 items like this, and I have four items per factor, then each of these factors is locally identified because I have more covariances to be explained than I have loadings being used to explain them. So for four items, I'd have six covariances. I would have four loadings. So each of these is identified on its own. By putting all 12 together and only having three factors, absolutely the model is over-identified. So if we count them up, 12 items times 12 plus 1 divided by 2, that gives me the number of possible variances and covariances among my 12 items. Add in the 12 means again, so there's 90 total. So the maximum number of parameters that I can estimate is 90 because that's how many means, variances, and covariances I have for my 12 items. In my measurement model, I am going to estimate nine loadings because the first loading is fixed to one for each of my factors. That leaves me with nine. I am going to estimate an intercept per item, so there's my 12, and a residual variance per item, so all my E variances are separate. So that means that I've spent 33 parameters, I've got 57 left over. So my measurement model, most of the over-identification is here. Most of the information about fit is going to describe how well the item covariances are recreated by these factors. Does it matter if I move the identification to a different item? If I made the last items uh, loading one instead? Nope. When would it matter? There's only one circumstance in which it would matter. If that item is not related to the structure? Yeah, if the item's loading is near zero or zero, then it has no information to pass up to become the factor variance and the model will blow up. But that's the only time it matters. So here's my structural model then. Now if I think about these lower order factors as the items, I'm doing air quotes, as the indicators, then in terms of degrees of freedom, I've got three lower order factors times three plus one divided by two is the number of variances and covariances among my lower order factors. There's no new information with respect to their means, and so that's zero, and so I've got six degrees of freedom. 
for the structural model. If I estimate each of my factor variances, that's three. If I estimate all possible covariances among them, that's three. The structural model is just identified. So the fit of the structural model has to be perfect because there's no room for it to be wrong. This model is going to perfectly recreate the pattern of variance and covariance among my factors. It will imperfectly recreate the pattern of variance and covariance among my indicators for the items down here because I've got 57 degrees of freedom I'm not spending. In terms of what misfit could be, if each item gets its own intercept, then what has to be fine in terms of fit? What are the intercepts trying to recreate in terms of the data, the means? Likewise, if each item gets a separate error variance, then what has to be fine in terms of recreated data? The, the total variances, yeah. Yeah, because these residual variances just swoop in to be whatever is left over after the factor has its due. So that means misfit is a, fa a function of the extent to which these loadings do not adequately recreate the covariances among the items. In this case, that's what the 57 is going to be for, from. So this structural model is just identified. This is as good as that structural part will get. Now, what about this? What if I said, no, 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 I don't want them to be related. I think these are three subscales, and they all measure this one common thing, and so I want to have a higher order factor. Several of you have asked me about this in your homework, and yes, indeed, this is a, this is a very common type of model. So I have HF here for higher order factor. Um, I could have done HO, but we've already used that term, so I didn't want to, like, double dip. So it's HF, higher factor. So the measurement model is exactly the same. Still 57 degrees of freedom left over. Now on the structural model, still six possible parameters. Now what have I estimated instead? Well, I've got three higher order factor loadings in which the higher order factor is a predictor and what the outcome is, is the lower order factor. For identification, I fix the variance of the higher order factor to 1 so that I can estimate all three loadings. The lower order factor variances then get a new term. They conceptually represent variance left over. Do you remember how I called error variance not the factor? Same thing. The error variance that's left over for these lower order factors is whatever is not the higher order factor. You can call it error, you can call it specific, you can call it unique, I don't care. Doesn't matter. Not the factor. But just because this wasn't complicated enough, we need a new term. Factor variance left over is called a disturbance. I know. I don't know why. Error would be, you know, too straightforward, I guess. So error variances go with item, disturbance variances go with factors, but conceptually they mean the same thing. It's the part of that construct that is left over after controlling for being predicted by the higher order factor. So if I count up the number of structural model parameters, I still have three variances, except rather than them being variances, they're disturbances and I have replaced my three covariances with my three loadings, just identified. How well is this model going to fit relative to the previous one? The same. Exactly the same. Exactly. And do you know why? How many lower... That one slide and that one left room where you were like, these are all the same. The Yes, but mm, let, let's recall it back. How many items do you need to test whether they measure one factor? Four. four. How many lower order factors do I have here? Three. three. If you only have three items, what do you get? Three. 
just identified, meaning that you have spent all your degrees of freedom, you have traded your three covariances for three loadings, the end. So there's no way to test whether you have a higher order factor or not if you only have three lower order factors unless you're willing to put some constraints on there. What could I do to, to put constraints on here to make my higher order factor testable? Factor loadings. Which ones though? I've got these ones and I've got these ones. Higher ones. Higher ones, yeah. Could I make these all be the same number? Yep. How many degrees of freedom would that save? Two. Yeah, because I have one loading instead of three. Then it's testable. But then I'm saying that these are all equally related to the higher order trait, which may not be true. That might be plausible in some contexts, but not in others. So how would I make a higher order factor testable? Got to get a fourth one. Yep. If you're not willing to put the constraints on there, get a fourth one. Um, you could also put constraints potentially on the lower order factor variances, but keep in mind that what those numbers would be is a function of the marker item that's used, and so they may not necessarily be on the same scale. So that could be done, but carefully. And what if reviewer two is like, well, I think the reason that it's just identified is because you didn't use a marker item up here. Okay, how about that? Hey, okay, watch. Eh? 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 You can't look at your phone while I'm airing if you're going to miss the gag. <laughs> For those of you who are old like me, camera one, camera two, camera one, camera two. That's a Wayne's World reference. I'm sure you can find it on the YouTube. Could I do this instead? One, yeah. loading. One, loading. Does it matter? Nope. Still just identified. So I can either estimate three loadings and fix the fa higher order factor variance to one, or I use a marker item and estimate this higher order factor variance, and it's the same. So. So yeah, you need four. That's what you need. Or you need, you know, constraints of some kind. I would say that it depends on the role of this thing in the context of the rest of the model. So if this thing is a predictor of some other stuff, then having its variance be one, like on this slide, means that you could interpret your slope coefficients coming from it as a one standard deviation change kind of thing. If this is an outcome of other stuff that's over here, then you'd want this number to be estimated so that it can come down as more stuff predicts it. Otherwise, I don't think it matters. It's just a difference in scale. Here's another example. So in this case, each factor, uh, the lower order, we've got something called problem solving, cognitive restructuring, expressing emotions, and social support. This is from your textbook. Each of these I would call locally just identified because each factor has only three indicators. At the upper level though, I've got four, which means that I could have one higher order factor or I could have two. So in this model, I've still got my 12 items, 12 times 12 plus one divided by two plus the 12 means, I've still got 90 possible degrees of freedom. I can spend eight loadings so each of these lower order factors, one loading is fixed to one, the others are estimated. 12 intercepts, 12 residual variances, there's my 32. So my lower order model is way over identified. The structural model then, I've got four of these. So four times four plus one divided by two, no more means into the story gives me 10. So I could either say, I've got these four loadings, I have, let me see here. No higher order factor variances. I've got one covariance and I've got four disturbances. So the E thing right here, that would be a D in some other textbooks, but he's gone with E. I could do it that way or I could do a marker item here. Either way, I've got one degree of freedom left over. 
So this model is actually a simplification in terms of degrees of freedom spent relative to just letting these four factors just be correlated. I'm trading six covariances among these four lower order factors for four loadings and one in this covariance right here. Now, the only situation in which this won't work is if there is no covariance up here because then each of these is locally under identified in the same way that any factor would be if it has just two indicators. So this covariance is what makes this possible with one degree of freedom to spare. So you can have as many higher order factors as your data permit and as your theory indicates. So if you only have two lower order factors, can you have a higher order factor? You could, yeah. but you'd have to constrain its loadings to be equal. So what that would mean is that, you, like in this right here, like if you just had this much, you'd have to fix these two loadings to be equal, in which case what you've done is take the covariance between problem solving and restructuring and give it a name and draw a circle around it. That's what you've done. There's no way to let one of these have more weight than the others. Um, in theory, it's possible to unconstrain their loadings once this is embedded in a larger model. But if you have convergence problems, this is the first place I would come back to, is that each little piece has to be able to stand on its own. So yeah, you could have a higher order factor, but it is literally just the covariance between the two of these with the circle and a name. Three is just identified and four is over identified, same as it was for the lower order measurement model. So the process then, if I have at least four lower order factors, is comparing relative to a saturated model, where I don't mean saturated in terms of the measurement model, I mean saturated in terms of the structural model. So the right comparison to see if this fits is to first see what the fit is if I just let all four factors be correlated. And then see if this structural model fits worse than that because I've saved one degree of freedom. So this is a model comparison that we have to do ourselves. This is not given to us in any of the output. So the first step is to see what are the covariances among the lower order factors? How well does the model fit? Because that's perfect. That's just identified. Then you can start simplifying by fitting higher order factors. That's crazy, right? To think about this as simpler, but it is. Because you're, you're replacing covariances with the loadings. So you're saving parameters. If you only have three, too bad. The only way you can make uh, tests is to do constraints. Uh, you could also have multiple higher order factors. So I have a plug here for a former student who just got graduated, Kelly Gwynn from sociology. I have a link to her dissertation. I know. She had the done kind. It has been written up and turned in, and she is out in the world uh, doing research and you know making money and stuff, living the American dream. She had six indicators of what, at the beginning of her dissertation, she thought were indicators of general school readiness in kindergartners. Approach to learning, math, language, social competence, emotional competence, and behavioral regulation. And as any parent could probably have predicted, these are not unidimensional. It turned out that in her study, she ended up with starting with a single higher order factor that did not adequately recreate the covariances among these six factors and switching into a two higher order factor model or a dual model as she called it, one where it was the academic indicators and one where it was the non-academic. This is my son. <laughs> when I was initially worrying about sending him to kindergarten and public school, I was not worried about his math or his reading or anything academic. I was worried about him being able to keep his shit together when he doesn't get his way. Because throwing a fit in a kindergarten class of 30 children is very different than throwing a fit in a class of 10 children in a Montessori setting, which is where he is. So this resonated with me quite a bit, but ultimately the data also had, had a say 
And that's where she ended up with two factors that then served as outcomes of a whole bunch of other stuff in the rest of her dissertation analysis. So that was like her, one of her chapters was just figuring out that she needed two higher order factors. The next chapters were then using them to predict stuff and to be predictive. All right. So when would you want to do this? I'll show you how to do it, but I think a more important question is why would you do this and when would you not want to? So it all depends on the context. Why are you fitting these factors? What is the question that you eventually want to answer with respect to how the factors relate to each other? So if I have a situation in which I have my higher order factor here and I have standardized loadings here, by the way, in each of these pictures, so 0 0.81, 0 0.85, 0 0.89, meaning that all three of these lower order factors, I would say, are strong indicators of this higher order factor. If I have this, some idea of a set of predictors of this higher order factor, I would argue this is not that useful of a model. Because why couldn't you just have the predictor predict each of these? If you think about it, having the predictor predict the higher order factor, which in turn predicts the lower, is a type of constraint. Because you're assuming that the relationship between the predictor and each of these lower order factors is basically the same. You're saying that that relationship is only different because of the way that the higher order factor relates to the lower order factor. That's a testable hypothesis. So if the higher order factor section is an outcome, it's prob it may not be that useful. How about the other way? Much more useful. If the higher order factor is meant to be a predictor of other stuff, then one could argue that it makes more sense to have it. Because otherwise, what might happen if you had separate paths from F1 to the outcome, F2 to the outcome, F3 to the outcome, is that they fight against each other. Remember collinearity? back in the day, or multicollinearity, however you want to call it, it gets harder and harder to determine what the unique effect of a predictor is, the more related the predictors are to each other. These standardized loadings indicate that these factors are going to be fairly highly related. So it becomes difficult to determine how much F1 brings to the party after controlling for F2 and F3 if these are highly related. So this is a simplification that you might be willing to live with to be able to say, like, what is it that they have in common and how does that predict the outcome as opposed to how does each predict it separately? This is also helpful if you start your dissertation with what you thought was one factor and it becomes three and all of your research questions in your dissertation were about one word and not three words. This is a way to kind of rescue that idea to make it back to one again but still pay attention to the fact that there's an additional correlation of items that are measuring the same thing down here. Because that's conceptually what the higher order factor loadings are doing, is allowing an extra correlation for these items that is distinct from this one, from this one. Okay, how are we doing? Nado? I didn't mean to tease you about your phone, by the way. You, you just missed the gag, right? You have, to, you have to watch the screen. Do you remember Wayne's World? Yeah. You do? Okay, the camera one, camera two. That's what I was doing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, here's a pro tip. If you have to explain your joke, it's not funny. I know that. Also, if you have to tell people that you're funny, you're not funny. All my friends think I'm funny. Uh -huh. All the students who I'm grading and writing letters of recommendation for think I'm hilarious, right? That's how that works. Anywho, so in both of these pictures, I'm operating under the assumption that the underlying factors have a lot of overlap. They would have relatively strong correlations among them that would justify the existence of a higher order factor for representing what they have in common. But what if I get something like this? So the first standardized loading is 0.21, the second is 0.95, and the third is 0.16. Could this happen? Mm -hmm. Now tell me what this is. Uh, mostly two, 
a smattering of one and three. So if I'm going to stick this higher order factor into a model and have it predict stuff or be predicted and I don't really know what to call it, ew. Like in this type of situation, I don't know that this is useful. I would say just predict them separately because they're, they don't have enough overlap to justify combining them. And factor two is largely going to be doing the work in terms of what this higher order factor means. Also this. I have seen this before. I once had a student who had, I think she had five or six lower order factors, and she did the likelihood ratio test against the model where they were just all correlated, and she fit her higher order factor model, and the fit was nearly perfect. And she was all excited until she showed me the standardized loadings, and they look like this. Can you guess what I said to her? Feel free to read from the slide, too. Yeah, it's not a thing. It, there's nothing in common here. So I don't know what utility would be gained by having the lack of commonality represent these three disparate things. Like, they don't go together. I mean, you can fit the model, but the model is perfectly recreating the non-relationships among these lower order factors. Blech. So I would treat them as just separate entities. They're not, they shouldn't be put together. This is how related they are. That's my take. Can I tell you a story? Here's a story. Wait, can, before you go into story, can I ask my question? Please. This looks complicated. It is. <laughs> are there general, like, cutoffs? Like, when should, like, we be careful of, like, because, like, obviously the examples you have here are very illustrative. But, yes. Like, what you should be, should and shouldn't be doing. My question is really on like the top right box. Like, what are the lowest kind of loadings? Um, I don't know that there are conventional cutoffs. More is better. There are models, by the way, in which you could have the higher order factor predict this and separate paths from each of the factors. If the higher order factor isn't responsible for most of the variance. Then you could see like what F1 contributes after controlling for this. Like if whatever is not the factor matters too, you can do that. I don't know how to explain that to people, like, like how you would say what it is then if it's not that. You'd have to have like a really strict and well-supported theoretical structure to, to really interpret what a path from not this to this other thing would mean. Uh, more is better. I would say, yeah. but there's nothing that stops you from doing this regardless of how low the loadings are. It's just what makes sense. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's the harder, the more abstract you get into what's latent, it's harder to like know what to label your variables because ultimately we're drawing circles around piles of covariance. We can put the labels in here, but whether it actually is what we think it is is a validity argument that we really haven't addressed. Right. One could argue that, um, you know, so like if we look at the bottom left corner here, if two is the most related, like one would have to think about what does two have that the other two don't, and then I have to use like that, that would have to inform what I call this. And so to me, that's sort of heading into validity territory as to what it would be, because if it were more F1 or F3, then those loadings would be higher. But yeah, it, it gets increasingly squishy the more abstract you get. Great, thank you. Yeah, and, 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 and I'm appropriately um, ambivalent, I think, because I, there, there aren't hard and fast rules. But what I can tell you as a segue into my story is that if what you want to know is how F3, say, predicts the outcome above and beyond F1 and F2, this model does not tell you that. So here's my story. This is the SEM that I ended up with in my dissertation, the done kind, as evidenced by the fact that I'm standing here in front of you. So I had a, my dissertation was a data collection exercise because that was back when I was in graduate school trying to straddle the line of a cognitive psychologist and a quantitative psychologist. And I won a grant from State Farm Insurance Companies to do my dissertation, which was looking at 
the extent to which measures of visual function and attentional function could predict uh, risk for accidents in older adult drivers. So I measured visual impairment, and I have indicators of that as far acuity and contrast sensitivity at various levels. I have their chronological age. I have a measure of what is known as processing speed, and I have a latent variable for driving impairment, which was indicated by observed measures of performance in a driving simulator. So how well they were able to stay within their lane, how well they were able to do a divided attention task, the number of accidents they had in the simulator, uh, the number of stop signs that they blew through in the simulator, how quickly they did the simulator driving course, and whether or not they got speeding tickets. And the latter, of course, had a negative residual correlation there. The faster you go, the more likely you are to get a speeding ticket in the driving course. So I can do that. And as a postscript, it turned out that performance in this driving simulator predicted whether or not they had an accident five years later, which it was a follow-up study. But the story that I want to tell you today is about this part of the model. So the whole purpose of my dissertation was this green box right here. I made up a measure of selective attention that I called driver scan, which was based on a change detection task that was used in cognitive psychology for other things. And like research question number one in my dissertation was whether or not this test offers incremental prediction of driving above and beyond these existing measures. Okay, that was my question. That's a fairly standard question, so I built this all fancy model. And at the time, there was a new faculty member at where I was a graduate student who invited themselves onto my dissertation committee. That happened. And that person was my boss at the time and was best friends with my advisor, and so I felt like I could not say no. So I had six faculty members in my dissertation defense, six. And this person looked at the correlations among these three measures, which were in the 0.5 to 0.6, the 0 .5 to 0 0.6 range, and insisted that I should have fit a latent factor for these three measures because they were so highly related. They wanted that. And so about 15 minutes of my dissertation defense was spent with me arguing with this person that if I put a, them into a latent factor and then had the latent factor predict driving, I couldn't answer the question as to whether this predictor was incrementally useful relative to these two. And by the way, it was. So that's what the yellow circle is here. This one was significant and this one was significant as well. And so at the end of the 15 minutes, what became clear is that this person had not only not read my dissertation, but hadn't even read the research question. And eventually, my advisor put a stop to the debate, and I continued on, and I graduated. But um, this is an example of you don't always need a latent variable. Like, that didn't tell me what I wanted to know. If my question was, how well do these things work together to predict driving risk? then a latent variable with one path from attention down to driving would make sense. When I published this work, by the way, I did end up fitting that model as a comparison, just in case the reviewers were in cahoots with that same person. So what you do with your measures, I think, depends on the questions you're trying to answer. And are you interested in how things work jointly? in which case a latent variable should work better than any of the individual pieces? Or are you interested in comparing and contrasting how well each measure works? If it's the latter, I wouldn't put them together. So that's the other part of the, the consideration of when a higher order factor would be a useful thing, is to what extent do you want to know whether the common variance has a relationship with other stuff? If that's what you want, great then hopefully your data will support it. If that's not what you want, then you don't need a higher order factor just because you have multiple things that are correlated. You can just let them be correlated and that's okay. Was that a good story? Would you like to know the postscript to the story? The postscript to the story is that when I was elected president of the Society of Multivariate Experimental Psychology, that faculty member was one of the people I beat. <laughs> Ta-da! 20 years, about 20 years later, right, I, I got mine. So that made it especially nice. So thank you to those of you who voted for me. All right.
Anywho, there's my story. Uh, yeah, I am currently the president. So last, I was elected in 2021, which meant that I had to do um, a lot of work in putting the conference together. Next year, that same conference is actually coming to Iowa. We are hosting it, which means that all the local students get to go because that's part of the rules of the society. So that will be in October of next year. And it should be um, a really great experience to get to meet some of these people whose books and articles you're reading. So, turns out most of them are really nice. Hmm? I said, and whose podcast are you listening to? And whose podcast you're listening to? Yes, um, potentially them as well. So we have to convince people that Iowa is a cool place to come to for a conference. That that's the problem, right? Everyone's like, "Where's your conference?" Like, "Oh, it's in Vegas, right? Or it's in New York? It's in Chicago?" We're like. Iowa City, woo! Said no one ever. But we're going to make it fun. We're going to have, a, I think, maybe a karaoke night. We're going to have Don Hedeker's band, the Pocaholics, play one of the nights, I'm hoping. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fun. It's going to be fun. Anywho, 304, end of the story time. Uh, yeah, let's see. Do I, have the, do I have the strength to start the example? I got to decide. I think we can start it, maybe the higher order factor example, but we won't get very far. Otherwise, we could talk about, nah, yeah, let's do that, let's do that. I don't want to get into the new thing yet. This is a different story. Uh, these are data that are real data, so they're not inside your download folder, but this is example eight, to illustrate the process of fitting higher order factor models, either using a CFA model or an IFA model, which I fit both versions to the same data set just to show you what they would look like in each case. So this is uh, example eight, which we will probably just get into the story and then have to go. But these are responses from college students. So this is one of the initial rounds of item response testing for develop, to develop a new instrument. And I believe the resulting instrument, I have a link to where I think it was published. These aren't the same data that are in the paper, but it's, it should be roughly the same items. Essentially what they are measuring is five different ways to be mean to your child. It is. That, I mean, that's what it is. So they have factors like spurning, terrorizing, isolating, corrupting, and ignoring. So distinct kinds of maltreatment slash abuse is what they were trying to measure. This sample, however, is just your standard intro psychology student uh, pool. So as you might imagine, most of the responses are on the low side for this. The, all of these responses are positively skewed. Most of these students did not have a lot of terrible things happen to them, fortunately. So this is one instance in which, even though it's on a five-point scale, probably IFA is going to be the more reasonable model, given the fact that these responses are not normally distributed, nor are they continuous. But I wanted to show you what the process would look like, regardless of what your measurement model looked like. So what you don't see in this handout is all of the legwork that I did first to determine that each of the factors items fit it reasonably well. So within maximum likelihood robust estimation for the CFA model and WLSMB for the IFA version of the model, you can see the results of the chi-square and CFI RMSEA. Not great, not super great, but I didn't want to add a bunch of residual covariances or other things that I really wasn't in a theoretical position to justify. So I'm going with this as sort of good enough for demonstration purposes. One thing that's interesting about these data is that the CFI column in particular, if you look at what the values are from the CFA model, CFI, excuse me, and the WLSMV model in IFA, they're much higher. So it looks like the data fit better after you account for the fact that they're ordinal rather than interval. But they're, the two types of models are not directly comparable. So this is the fit of each of the separate factors. Down below, I have the standardized factor loadings for each of them under each method, and the standardized loadings tend to be higher for the WLSMV IFA solution as well. Okay. So the first thing I did is answer the question, can I just add all of these up and make it like one sum score for child maltreatment? I'm calling this the straw man model. Do you know this term? Yes, yeah, straw man is a term that means a point of comparison that you don't really think is a comparison. It's just like you're putting it out there solely for the purpose of showing that it doesn't work. 
So it's a straw man argument is the phrase that is often used, but this is like the straw man model. Like, I know this isn't going to work, but I'm showing it anyway to make a point. So I wanted to show this to you as a trick to help you simplify your code. So the name statement has all the variables in the data set and use variables has all the variables in the model and you notice that they don't match. Why do you think that is? Can you guess? It's in line with the one factor? Uh, no, they're not in order. So they were so that the, the order of the items does not correspond to their order in the model, but why do you think I'd have the blank spots? So they're not with the factor? Yeah, those items sucked. That's what happened. Is that this was like the initial round, they threw out the items that did not measure their factors, and so they had a reduced set. Now, what do you think would happen if I forgot that? And say item five and item fifteen and all the other ones where the holes are were still included. It, 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 estimate, it put them in the model, but if they're just not associated with anything, they'd just be like boxes just floating in your SEM. And because you haven't put any relationships with them, then they would not fit well. So if you have a model that like fits really super badly and you're like, what did I do? If it didn't misread the data, that'd be the first thing I check. Check to make sure you don't have just extra boxes just floating in there. The, that you've actually kicked them out of the model if you don't want them in your factor structure. So here is here are the measurement models. I've got spurn, terrorizing, isolating, corrupting, ignoring. And this, I think, was largely on the basis of EFA, which is why there's an uneven number of items measuring each trait. And this is the trick that I wanted to show you. So I have all the factor means fixed to zero, all the factor variances fixed to one. That means that the factor covariances are all going to be in a correlation metric because the variances are one. So here's what I did to not have to rewrite my code to fit the single factor model. I fixed all of the factor covariances, which are now correlations, to one. I did that so that I didn't have to retype all of this into one factor. If all five factors are perfectly correlated, that is the same thing as saying there's only one factor in the data. So this is a trick by which you can test simpler models using the same code to keep all of the items within their own separate factors. Because of that constraint, I get the dreaded non-positive definite methods. It says it's not positive definite, a correlation greater than or equal to one or a linear dependency or other bad stuff. Yeah, it's this one. It's because that's what I did. I fixed the correlation to one and it's mad at me. So this is the one case in which you can ignore that message. If we look at the rest of the fit though, RMSEA is fairly happy. CFI and TLI are not. One reason besides their difference in baseline is that RMSEA is a measure uh, that favors parsimony. And this is a very parsimonious model, having 49 items as indicators of one factor. So it's relatively happier than the other fit measures would be. But this indicates, yeah, definitely not. So this will be the straw man against which the other models will be compared on Thursday. There's my straw man. So if a single factor model fits worse, I wouldn't add them up into one thing. That, that's my take home message. I would go the higher order route if you still want to talk about one thing instead of five things. All right, 312, how are we doing? Questions or things you want to hear again? Not yet? Yes? Yes. In this context, you are feeling a CCA, right? I am. So, uh, what, why do you want to compare between the MLR and WLSMD estimator? I am not going to do any model comparisons between the two. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I wanted to do is do it both ways to emphasize that 
once you get to talking about the structural model, everything works exactly the same if you had done a CFA versus an IFA. I would not, there, it doesn't make any sense to, to like fit it in one way and see if it's better than the other because they're, they're based in different measures of height in terms of like what is being recreated or maximized. So in CFA, they're trying to recreate a Pearson correlation matrix. In IFA, they're trying to recreate a polychor correlation matrix. And so they're, they're different, different things. But good question. That can be confusing if you do report different types of solutions. It can look like you're trying to compare across them, but I'm not. I'm just trying to do it one way and do it the other, just so that you have an example of what it would look like either way. All right. Anything else for today? Yeah. Yeah, so that's what, that's what I had done first, is just fit each factor by itself, only those items, to make sure that each factor's items fit well enough before putting everything together into a five-factor model. And some of these are not quite well enough according to CFI. RMSEA is reasonably okay, and it's the opposite pattern when I do the IFA version of the model. CFI is happy with everything. RMSEA is not as happy. All right. One more. And the last one, yes. To calculate the correlation between factors, we must take the factor variance and covariances, right? Yes. So in this model, I, S, I identified it to have the factor variances all fixed to one so that the width refers to correlations rather than covariances. Otherwise, fixing it to one would not guarantee a perfect relationship because you'd have to figure out what a perfect covariance would be and fix it to that. And that's too much math. I'm too lazy for that. So yeah, so just for this purpose, I'm, I'm going back to my usual z-score method of identification so that I can have correlations rather than covariances to work with in terms of the 5 versus the 1. Where we're headed, by the way, is summarized at the end of these tables. A comparison of what it looks like for one factor, five correlated factors, five factors with a higher order factor, and so forth as comparison models. And one factor fits unequivocally worse, no matter which way you, you do it. So it's five things, not one thing. All right, 316. That means I'd be quiet. Let me know if you need anything. You can work on your next formative assessment, and I will let you know when your, next, your last homework is available. Hope to see everybody Thursday. Thanks for being here. Bye, Zoomers. <laughs>